How you guys doing? Let me ask you something. Do you mind if we do something a little different now? Is that okay with you guys? Something very special? Something that no other city in the world is gonna get on this tour? Well, today's a very, very special day in Dream Theater history. It was 15 years ago on this very day that an album came out that changed all of our lives forever. And we're gonna play that entire album for you right now, okay? Who was that? That doesn't look like the same person that I saw this morning in the mirror. <laughs> anyway, hello everybody. Welcome to the audio commentary. Um, we'll go around the room to identify everybody's voices before we begin. I'm Mike Portnoy. I'm John Petrucci. James. I'm Jordan Rudis. And John Mayung. And welcome. It is December 1st, 2004. We're recording this commentary at the Hit Factory in New York City, where we are working on our latest album. And this video that we're doing the commentary for was recorded March 6th of this year. So this was already about nine months ago. And this was the 15th anniversary to the day of the release of One Dream and Day Night. So here we are. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello. Hey. We're, we're off and rocking. There's Jose, <laughs> once again making his appearance. He, he makes more appearances in this DVD than the Budokan one. This was a great venue, I remember that. Beautiful place. Their first time playing there. The Pantages. I think they have like uh, sh Broadway shows and stuff there. I think like uh, the producers, I think, or oh, yeah? oh, really? shows there. Interesting. I mean, this was actually one of the very first rock concerts there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can tell because after the gig, we got a guitar cake. They gave us a cake with a guitar on it? It was shaped like a guitar, the whole so cake. So it was, was obviously a like a big deal for them to have a rock yeah. band playing there. Yeah. It'd be great to play there, you know, for all future L.A. shows. It was really beautiful. So anyway, this was um, a fun night. I mean, for many, many, many years, uh, we've constantly been asked if we would ever re-record When Dream of Day Unite with the current lineup. And um, of course, I don't think we would have any interest of doing that in the studio, but it was always an inter interesting idea to possibly get a live version of this. And uh, this was an idea I had in 2003, you know, projecting ahead to the 2004 tour, realizing that that would be the 15th anniversary. So I remember suggesting real early on yep. that that we should uh, do that on March 6th. And I even told uh, Steve Martin and Frank Solomon, our booking agent and management, I don't know where we're going to be on March 6th, right, right. but just mark your calendars on that date. And, you know. Worked out great. Not only were we on tour, but we were in a very cool city. Well, actually, I mean, that was not by accident. You know, I mentioned to Steve to, you know, if you can, place us in L.A. or New York or Chicago, right. place us in a cool city on March 6th. And uh, it did work out really great that it was L.A. And we started rehearsing all of these tunes on the European tour throughout January and February. Secretly, of course, at Soundchecks with the PA mm -hmm. off. Yeah, the interesting thing, yeah, interesting thing is we do a lot of uh, rehearsing and stuff while we're on the road. Some things take more time than others, but I remember going through this stuff and it was like riding a bike, playing some of these songs. It just came right back. Um, and, you know, we had played them all at, at one point or another, but mm. it felt like yesterday that we'd written them, and it's yeah. pretty wild. This was actually part of a medley, this tune, when I first joined the right. band, right? Didn't we play? We did uh, wild this and Only a Matter of Time, part of a medley on the Metropolis tour. Right. right. So you had played the, these two, right. and you had played pieces of Yitzhak Jam from the Instra medley. Right. And we were playing Only a Matter of Time and the ones who helped us set the sun right. on this tour. So it was a good head start in my yeah. learning process. This, this uh, <laughs> moment right here is really hard for me to hear, the snare drum, because uh, in my mix in the inner ear monitors is mostly guitar, as you can imagine. Uh -huh. And when you go down and mute that low, yeah. you just hear a ton of bass from right. the amp in the cabinet. So you're like in complete I'm focus. I'm there. standing right next to the drum, actually listening to the yeah, acoustic snare. 
I'm like in major counting world. They're <laughs> right. listening to you. I'm just trying to like zone listening in. To you, you probably guys have, very carefully. You probably have the same thing at the end of only a matter of time when I come down and it's just the oh, snare totally. drum carrying it. I'm just going by feel. Now you played this solo right off the record. Yes. And I did the drum solos bef- out into the solo right off the record as well. Cool. This is a great solo. Oh, thank you. This is the, in the sweeping days, right? That was very Ingve inspired. That's yes, right. Yes. Well, when when did we write this? Give people an idea. This was written in eighty seven. Eighty seven. The end of eighty seven. Yeah. Or so. maybe eighty eight. No, it was written after we had already done our eighty seven instrumental demos. Right. Which was, I think, the summer of eighty seven, and then this was one of the next ones written right before Charlie joined the band. In fact, Charlie's audition at Charlie's audition in eighty seven, he sang. A bit of this song, like you know, we, he ca- a bit of the history with Charlie joining the band was he came to his audition in '87 and was trying to emulate Chris Collins because part of the audition process was lo- singing all the Majesty songs from '86, and of course Charlie's range is just completely different from Chris Collins, hmm. so the audition was actually a complete failure, and he, you know we we were pretty much just going to uh, you know say okay nice thanks for coming down yeah. that was the end of it. Because he just was not, he didn't have that range we were looking like for. A, like an octave lower or something? Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we were looking for a Chris Collins, Jeff Tate, Bruce Dickinson kind of thing. Right, and Charlie right, was right. more of like a Billy Joel, Elton John, Paul McCartney. Hmm. And so singing the Collins stuff just didn't work. But then, you know, he was like, hey, well, do you have anything that new that you're working on we could, you know, jam or whatever? And we, we played a bit of Fortune. And that's when we were able to hear his true voice. And then, then it, I guess it struck us. Yeah, I remember um, going to Charlie's uh, apartment where he lived and like working on lyrics and stuff like that. And, and uh, I remember being impressed because he knew how to roll sushi. <laughs> oh wow, had, that is a, impressive. He, he introduced us roll. to sushi. Yeah, actually, he did. You're yeah. right. We went to a karaoke bar where we used to re- rehearse in Huntington. Yeah. It's an important role in your lives. <laughs> it is. Now this song, Status Seeker, was a blatant attempt to try to write a hit single. I remember it was the last out, the last song written for When Dream of Day Unite. I don't remember that. Yeah, it was written about two weeks before we went into the studio. How much of this music was written with Charlie in the band? Or only this song, I believe. Only this song. So he had nothing to do with the writing. Well, he he wrote lyrics for a oh, couple he, songs, okay. and actually he co-wrote the lyrics for this song. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Um, okay. But this was the only song that was written once he was in the band. Okay. There's a, I don't know if you guys know, but I, I'm putting together an accompanying documentary with old right. footage. So a lot of the, the writing of each individual song is covered on that documentary via old interviews. So you at home, if you haven't watched it already, you can learn a lot about the history of this album by watching that. That's it. This album was uh, our first and our first experience in the studio. We're all uh, living together for a while. Pennsylvania. Terry Date producing. Not too much time in the studio for this one. Couple we did this weeks, well, three weeks we did yeah, this whole album. Weeks. We've already been here doing the latest Dream Theater album for over a month. And we're, we only have written, I think, four songs at this point. <laughs> At this point, for with this app, for when Dreaming Day and Night, we would have been done and delivered already. Wow. A lot of it's a lot of our first experiences. I mean, even just a recording in general. You know, using certain amplifiers and getting used to being in the studio and overdubbing and it was, it was all, all new. To, all new was, ground. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we had only ever done four tracks. Right. James, mm. you there? I'm here. <laughs> I'm just observing and listening. What, what, are your, what are your thoughts about mm. singing these songs through the years? Well, I do remember doing a couple of them the very first night I hooked up with you guys and jammed with you guys. But uh, and I remember the Images and Words tour. We basically we played, I think every one of them, didn't we, on that tour? Yeah. Yeah. We basically went through all of them and. Uh, 
So know, uh, we, well, uh, except for the ones who helped us at the sun, but everything right. else we did actually do right. at one point or another. Well, because uh, when we were on the uh, the images tour, we basically we had the uh, we needed to do the songs from the first album in order to uh, create a long enough set throughout the night. So uh, my memory with this album is that we did it quite a bit. The very first world tour we were out with. So uh, when it came back time to to bring these back and play the this the album in its entirety that was the first for that you know being able to do the album like from beginning to end every one of them so it was kind of cool it was it was great to uh to revisit these songs you know because as uh even though i had absolutely nothing to do with the first album i still had a great time singing these tunes and it was kind of cool to bring it back at this point in our career and revisit them and and enjoy them and uh i was quite impressed i still remember looking out at the crowd and even though definitely without a doubt there was you know the fans out there that aren't too familiar with this album but i was very impressed with the amount of people that you could see they were extremely excited the fact that we were doing this and presenting this album in its entirety it was really cool to see that reaction i think uh there were surely, and any time we play When Dream of the Night songs, there's always a handful of hardcore fans that are just, that's the highlight of the show for them, because right. people just love the old stuff. Mm -hmm. But then there's always a majority of the crowd that you just get the blank stares from. Right. And I remember right. this evening, you know, we, when, you know, when we did this for the entire second set, we, we had already played a two-hour right. first set. So, you know, we covered most of the new material and the history of the band within the first set, but... You know, when the second set came around, we did this whole album. There was there was a lot of blank stares, you know, and mm -hmm. inevitably some people were probably even disappointed. But, you know, I think uh, I, at least for me, I was thinking more in terms of recording it and capturing it on DVD, and you know that it was something that just yeah, it's definitely was, a was, part of our history. And now it's shared with with Dream Theater fans all around the world, you know, forever. It's documented mm -hmm. here, and I think this is special. A, it's a great release. I mean, just the the look of the whole thing. I think. It, it was shot really well, actually. It looks great. Sounds yeah, it great. Mm -hmm. It's a really cool thing to have, actually. It's like us recording the entire album live, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, it was definitely a historic night, and then the encore even made it even more historic. We'll talk about that later. But it was really one of the top, in my book, one of the top five Dream Theater gigs in Dream Theater history. Mm -hmm. I think it was just one of those really yeah. special, special evenings. It was. I remember, you know, it's so weird to us. We've been playing together for so long. And John and I have been playing together for so long, and I remember these riffs. They've been around for a while. In the basement? I mean, yeah, your, uh, man. I remember hearing house. some of these things and being like, what? What, you, what yeah, is that? Yeah. What time well, is that? <laughs> this riff, the It's a Jam riff, was written at Berkeley. It was E19. There you go. Oh, really? <laughs> yep. Yeah, the, we didn't complete the song right. until Kev joined up, and then like in 86 or so, we completed You'd Say Jim. E19, is that what you said? That was our rehearsal. Is that a code? E19. <laughs> but that main riff right there was, well, was from Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. We started You'd Say Jim at Berkeley. So if you hang out 85. in room E19 long enough, you just might get some of the uh, the vibes. Like so good. Something the Majesty yourself. Spirit. Right. The Majesty Spirit. And this, this part... Is cool because we did uh, we did decided to do solos for each guy, each instrumentalist in the band. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, wait, forget, I forget wait. the order. Actually, Kev is first. I remember writing this at Dare. Actually, we, that's where yeah. we completed it in '86. Oh, okay, right, that right. was once Kev and Collins were with us. So this is actually the oldest song uh, from When Dream of Day Night. This was the first, you know. Yeah. Well, so you can you can hear once again the influence of uh, Ingve. the Ingve, the trade-offs between Jens and Ingve, and also even Return to Forever with you know Al and uh, there's your solo. The, That's the uh, sad solo. <laughs> Doing a lot of tapping in those days. Yeah. Right? What was the story with That's this cool. mic? I played I, it five million times. Yeah, which I think we said this on a commentary already. Yeah. I think yeah, but I remember you rehearsing this solo. Over and over and over yeah. while we were in our apartment in Gladwin. Mm. Who am I thinking of? Um, oh, Chick, obviously. Oh, this was that studio where um, the same studio I did oh, the Vinnie Moore? Wait, wait, a bass solo right here, and unfortunately there was no video footage, John. I have to apologize for that. We were going to put a fake. That's okay, just. We, we have you on the screen back there. That's right. why we stay with John can, here. Can you paste me? 
in the bottom right hand corner. <laughs> just, <laughs> just like a fo- like one more yeah, than yeah, a photo. Is. The photo from the um, uh, photo from, from, from me the playing a hammer on. <laughs> no, not even the the photo from the uh, the what was it called? The calendar. We didn't have the photo, the real picture of John. So you had to use uh, the photo uh, from the album. What? What? What are you talking? The calendar, like the fan club thing. I don't know what you're talking about. What was it? We put. I don't know if it was a fan club thing or. But it, but it was uh, a Dream Theater calendar, and there were pictures of all of <laughs> all the different guys, like live shots or hanging out shots. But there was none of John, so it's like your picture from the album. I have no, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Of it. That's a good concept. <laughs> <laughs> Make it so. Just put him in the corner. Uh, just to clarify for historic purposes, actually, this is not the oldest complete song on When Dream of Day Unite, because actually we started this at Berkeley, but we didn't complete it till 86. Afterlife would be the oldest song. Hmm. Afterlife was the first completed song um, after the Majesty demos, and we actually played that live with Collins. I guess we could talk about that later. But Yitze Jam was also played in the Collins days. Were we playing this in, in, the, in Jordan? Hmm? Well, He's rehearsing this. Yeah. Jordan. That was where we rehearsed in uh, a haircutting place in yeah. Huntington. Basement. Yeah, but that by the time we moved to Jordan... Uh, that was after spell this. It. Yeah. <laughs> G-I-O-R-D-A-N. Jordan. Jordan. Some kind of Italian. Yeah, the guy's name. name. Uh-huh. Right. There's now going to be drinking to the stalkers hanging out. The stalkers hanging out there. Yeah. Jordan, that's your favorite uh, mode, your favorite chord. Right? Which one? You know, the... Uh, <laughs> What's it called again? I don't know. I don't know which chord you're talking about. Um, what is it? <laughs> you know, the half step above and the whole step below. Oh, oh, oh. Your favorite overused right. Uh, oh, right. chordal movement. Right. Like a Phrygian kind of thing yeah. or something. You love that one, don't mm. you? Oh, yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> Just, let's write another tune like that. <laughs> one more. I have an interesting story to tell you guys yeah. about on one of the songs off the first album. And uh, it was when you guys, when we were uh, throwing tapes back and forth to each other, and you guys uh, had sent me up a CD copy, and it had uh, Status Seeker on it, because I guess that was your, the single? And uh, so my CD player at the apartment was on the fritz, and I was really psyched to hear this song. So I went to a place called, uh, back then, they're not even around anymore, they're called Majestics Audio. And I went in pretending that I was looking at a stereo system that oh, I wanted really? to buy. That's cool. And I said, listen, I want, I want to hear this stereo here. It looks pretty cool. And it was a huge system. And the guy goes, yeah, well, get a CD. I go, no, I got, I got one here. Let me, let me hear this. <laughs> and, and the guy puts it in. I go, well, you know, I, I really want to hear it. And I remember just cranking mm. Status Seeker. And it was my first time hearing you guys. And I was, <laughs> I was getting really in it. You could see this guy. He was getting all freaked out because his tunes are cranking in the store. And finally, like, he goes, well, what do you think? I go, oh, well, yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, really like oh, the band. <laughs> needless to say, I got my CD player fixed within a couple of days, and then I was starting to play it at home. But that was so funny to see this guy. That would have been the Terry Brown remix. If that was the yeah. CD right. single yeah, it was, that you listened actually. to, yeah. we actually had two uh, songs mi- remixed by Terry Brown, Status Seeker and Afterlife, and then they were issued as CD singles hmm. for radio and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember about recording this song in the studio once again their first recording experiences I remember playing that classical beginning and really working on it and trying to get it to sound like you know something from Master of Puppets like you know I thought it was like great yeah, I was yeah. so happy and I remember asking Terry Date like what, what do you think you know and he's like well it's not going to win any classical awards but <laughs> <laughs> brutally <laughs> honest like, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> but I work so hard. <laughs> and you know, this version here is maybe the only time we ever played that intro live. Because uh, all throughout the time that you've been with us, James, we always did uh, like another hand right, and then just right. landed right on oh, that yeah, opening. Yeah. What is it, a G? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, no. right. So this was one of the few times we actually had that classical intro from the album. Mm-hmm. A lot of the versions are kind of mixed around here. Like, this version of Killing Hand is kind of the revamped version that we've been doing for years, but it has the intro from the album. And Status Seeker had the album intro, but uh, the live ending. There was there was a lot of uh, mm-hmm. mixing and matching between live and studio versions on these versions. 
I thought this was good uh, orchestration here. The sort of bass movement and harmonics. And the guitar ostinato and that type of drum beat. And then the mm -hmm. keyboard's just doing a pad. Smooth, I thought that was yeah. very nicely orchestrated for young lads. Mm. And now the gradual crescendo. That's it. Back to the group. I, I think this is the best written song on when, when Dreaming Day and Night. At least it was surely the most uh, unorthodox arrangement in terms of verse, chorus, and right. Mm -hmm. You know, it was written in many different kind of sections. This keyboard solo isn't part of the original that it, was added on the '96. You know, it's weird. Is that you know, we never? There was never a tour after on this. There, there was never a tour that happened after this record. No. That's you'll see if you walk the documentary. You know that the footage on there is very very limited. We did maybe ten shows, maybe you know, in support of this album right. with, with Charlie. Ever we was did it basically in the same area though? Yeah, New, all New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, just you know, wow. local Long mostly Long Island. Well, what, what happened is we—I mean—we had the, the biggest aspirations and dreams. This was our first record deal and everything. We signed it, and the label seemed to be really excited and into it and supportive and then it came out and we sort of found that nothing really happened there was no tour there was no tour mm -hmm. support there was Wait, no we were supposed to go out with crimson that band glory that, yeah, right. crimson yeah. glory they were talking about right. doing a tour of crimson glory in europe you're right and there was also never a video which in 1989 was crucial i mean every, every legitimate band had a video in 1989 and we didn't so there was a f total feeling of Illegitimacy. Yeah. Well, we we were kind of just ignored for some reason, and then that's obviously when we uh, knew that change had to be made. You know, not only with the label, but with, with Charlie. Sorry, sorry Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, I, you know, it was a small budget, and we, if you re recall, we recorded this album in summer of '88, and it wasn't even released till March of '89. Right. So it was sitting on the shelves for nine months before it even came out. So by the time it came out, we had been through a name change. That's true. And I think the label just had moved on at that point, you know. Now, don't you have the original cover of this with the ma that says Majesty? Yeah, well, that was uh, used on the uh, When Dreamy Day Night demo. Uh, oh, right, right. For you'd say jams, yes. the official bootleg. That's, that that was the original cover. But uh, back to what you were saying, John, there was so few shows um, and... You know, when going through my archives, it was very, very limited stuff, and usually the sound isn't very good or whatever, but you can get a taste of it on the documentary that's on this DVD, and, you know, uh, right. it's very limited stuff. We did two, the two biggest, the three biggest shows we did were opening slots. We did two shows with Winger in February of 89, one in Long Island and one in Connecticut at Toad's Place. And then the very, very final show we ever did with Charlie was uh, opening for Marillion at the Ritz in New York. I remember that. And in between there, there was maybe three headlining shows. We did one at the, the Living Room in Providence, Rhode Island, and then maybe two at Sundance on Long Island. It's barely anything. And then a couple of like showcase shows, at, one at the US Blues and one at SIR Studios, and both of those are included on the documentary. That's a good stance, Jordan. Mm. Thank you. I wonder if that had anything to do with the crazy hours that went into uh, the recording schedule. Oh, my God. Going in at, what, 6, six at night and coming out at 6 in the morning? Mm. Yeah. We were, we were night owls. The entire Wind Dream of Day and Night was recorded in the wee hours of the morning. And it was. Night. That's right. I, John, I think we should ha uh, implement those hours again. You want to go back to that? <laughs> no, but that, then, would make that you means happy. the next record's going to have the same fate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. This is the bit. See, back then we were all young and single, and we could work, you know, from six at night till six in the morning. But well, we not we, like that these days. No, we just packed up and left. Yeah, you know, we we uh, packed up, left, lived in Pennsylvania for the few weeks. You know, it was crazy. I mean, I was barely. Yeah. Uh, how old were we? Like twenty. Yeah. You know, you I remember kids. like after the album, like meeting my parents down in Disney World, like. That's how young we were. Like, oh, I'll, fly, I'll fly down when I'm done. 
you know. We had we were kids. It was exciting too because we recorded this at uh, Cajun Studios, which was in Pennsylvania, Gladwin, Pennsylvania, and Queensrÿche had just done Operation Mindcrime there. Right, right. So and that at this at this time was like our favorite album. You they know, did, they did Mind Crime at Cajun. Yeah, you don't I remember forgot, that? I forgot that. Yeah, we were like that was like the most exciting mm-hmm. thing for us that we were recording in the same studio where they did Mind Crime. Wow, but, I but why that. why did theirs come out so much better? <laughs> <laughs> they had more than three weeks <laughs> to make theirs. That's funny. Speaking about Queens I remember meeting them at a, a meet and greet and like bringing our Majesty demo and playing it for them. Yeah. And being like wow. such a little fans. Oh, and right. That is, that that is right story there. they did. Yeah. Remember that? Wow. Yeah, yeah. I, I even have a, a, a poster signed by them to Majesty. You know, yeah. like all the best. I remember Michael Wilton gave me his pick when, when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was later. <laughs> that was later. That that was, was the, they were opening for Metallica. Yes. That was in 89 or the Coliseum so. Coliseum or something? Yeah. And when Dream of Day Night had already come out at that point. So we had a little bit of, you know... There's so many things I remember from that meeting. I remember Jeff not being there. Like, where's Jeff? <laughs> Jeff wouldn't come out. I remember uh, Chris DeGarmo telling us that it was rocking. <laughs> With the thumbs up. The thumbs up. Rocking. Rocking. No, that, no, that, was, <laughs> like no, that was Chris DeGarmo. That was Michael Wilton. No, that, no, was, that, was, Chris, that was Chris. Was it? Yep. And it was at the time when they were, they were having a lot of success, obviously. And so that meant a lot. Remember, right? he gave advice. He was like, think big shapes. Big right. shapes. Well, Remember he said you, that. You've been thinking big shapes ever since. That's right. Right. You know, it's funny. In 89, Michael Wilton was giving you a guitar pick, and in 1993, you were teaching him, him his guitar solos. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, then we ended up doing a tour with Queensryche, which uh, was much overdue. It would have been a lot cooler. Did I say 1993? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2003. 2003, there you go. That, that tour should have happened, like, in 1993. Yeah. This song was written when we were in Total Queen's Reich Head. I remember yeah. when this was written, we were listening to Rachel Order at their studios. It was like 86 or 7, and right. we were totally into Rachel Order. This part's very sad. I always found it very sad. Well, that's... Very oh. Marillion, this part, right? Yeah, but you know what? This isn't on the original version. This no. was the, the new arrangement. Right. But that's the melody from the intro, obviously. Right. Snatch. <laughs> We're rocking now. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I think I'm going to change my look. Yay! Oh, what's it going to be? You heard it here first. <laughs> That's right. What are you going to go Short for? Short hair, shoulder, know, like, shoulder length. <clears throat> You're tired of looking the same for 20 years? <laughs> you look exactly the same as when I met you 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's actually kind of hit me as I'm watching this. I look like <laughs> I belong in like I look like I belong in a different band. <laughs> you look like you belong in Death Angel. I think you should dye your hair completely platinum. Yes. Uh, be like Nelson. Nah. I was going to say red. <laughs> he should do like the Smash- the guitar player from Smashing Pumpkins. Like the shoulder streaks. length and then red. No, I'm telling you right now. I can't color my hair. There's no way. <laughs> Can you color it? Come on, platinum no. like oh, Nelson. Not? Streaks, man. No, no, no. What are you thinking for length? Shoulder. Yeah, I'm just gonna go. I think. I think shoulder length. Nice you, casual. You realize you know you're, what? you're documenting this on a commentary. You're gonna be held to this now for the rest of your life. <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Bass solo. <laughs> Another strong bass statement. Second bass solo on the on the album so yeah. far. One in Yitzu Jam and one here in Killing Him. Well, one of the things that I remember we we pointed this out, Mike, a while back is when we were listening to those old demos. The bass was so present in our early writing and stuff the, the demos were like the bass is cranking you had all right. these melodies and uh, harmonics and stuff. you were playing like lead lead bass back in the it's a very harmonics. aggressive young man wait the, the ma- you know what you're talking the majesty demo yeah that uh, also, also this, Day this style this whole because right. Terry Date yeah. didn't really produce this album in terms of changes I right. think when we made Images and Words Prater probably Took you down the neck and put, made you play more root-oriented stuff. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but until Images, you know, Majesty Demo and The Wind Dreaming Day and Night, you were always doing tensions, mm-hmm. harmonics, and you were always way up on the neck. He thought you guys were just side men back there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we're supporting. Actually, you know, it, it's funny that you brought that up because I had the, the, the Majesty Demo 
I was cranking on the car stereo. Yeah. And you're right. It was. It's like. The bass. It's was like kicking. night and day compared to what's going on now. And yeah. you were playing the melodies and stuff. Yeah. A lot of like high stuff. And yeah. All right. That's listen, what I'm going, I'm, you, know, you become I, too mellow in your old it. age. He's wait, cutting his hair. Wait, I know what I have to do. What I need to it? go back to Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> I need to live, eat, and sleep music. I need to spend six hours a night in E19. Yeah. <laughs> and plus, your bass parts were very sad back then. Well, uh, aggressive th- but sad. Well, I think yeah. that's. Th- I think that will always be there. Yeah. yeah. Huh. Interesting. This is Light Fusing Getaway. This is one of the uh, least played songs at this point. In fact, when we did this in L.A., this was probably the only song that had only been performed maybe once or twice ever up until this point. I remember, um, for me, uh, probably for all of us, but it was a point that I noticed, as far as Kevin Moore was concerned, that um, he was a really uh, good lyricist. I remember when he wrote these words and everything, and they were so involved in so many of them, and... The rhyming and alliteration and all this stuff. I was like, wow, I never knew he really had such a talent. Yeah, this song and Only a Matter of Time yeah, were he, his two lyrics on this album. I mean, they were both They were great. Awesome. I still love them. You didn't do all your sound effects on the with the bass pedals at that point. Oh, that was the delay, right, John? Oh, right. The oh, you know what? Actually, I was going to do that. Yeah. But I kind of the, the way my rig was set up It wasn't really set up for that Yeah, I just got a, a wild memory here It was uh, We were playing a, at a club Just hearing these songs right now We were playing at a club on Long Island And I just remembered you one night Falling off stage Do you remember that? Oh man, I'll never forget falling you off stage You were running, running to the, uh, stage the front And you yeah. went right off the stage Right into the crowd Well, yeah Because the stage it was very, really small, and we built a runway for you. No, no. And you, it was barely no. a runway. It was a step. What was it? Yeah, a, a, it was a, a, a road case. A road case. <laughs> but, it, but in any event, it, it extended past the stage, and you were out there. So I ran out to join you. Oh, <laughs> my, no. my side of the stage ended. <laughs> you know what? If oh, I remember man. correctly, Charlie was there that night, was too. He? Yeah, I'm, uh, if I'm thinking the right gig here. Yeah. Well, that was that was funny. We had a video of that. Man, what a mess. This song's pretty progressive. Mm-hmm. The chorus was uh, purposely slowed down from the studio version. A little more groove oriented. I think the studio version is seriously lacking groove. But one of the things I remember from uh, about the way that we used to write is um, we we had we always linked lots of different feels and parts and mm-hmm. tempos and things you know it was all like 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 right here yeah, yeah going exactly. from that chorus to that verse a lot yeah. of quick turns yeah we right. were criticized for that you know like cut and paste type thing but, but it became part of a style yeah it's a just stylistic we, thing I didn't even realize when I first heard the band yeah about, you know before I joined I was like wow what is I was kind of introduced to that idea of making quick turns I was like what is that then I realized it's actually part of the style right right Something but I think that's big. why we did that little break before going into this verse in the in the new version I think it just helps things you know little things like that help the transitions yeah. be a little more smoother by the way that uh, in that last verse that I can't see where this is going just for the record that was uh, Charlie's girlfriend Linda hmm. at the time when we were at Cajun we called her on the phone and recorded her saying that wow. was that a real conversation or you just told it to no it was staged it was part of yeah. Kev's lyrics Right. Another bass yeah. lead part. I, that's, I that's, that's a cool part. <clears throat> yeah, you know what it is? I, I think the way we interacted back then mm-hmm. and the way we interact now is different. Like, that was like, we had a routine every night. We'd practice every, right. every like, Monday through Friday. We'd always be there and everything. And now it's, I don't, it's just different now. Yeah. Oh, we're we're yeah. older and we have families. I mean, it's, uh, you know. Guys, let's do it again. Let's get in the van. <laughs> you know what? It, you rehearse know what, Monday you know, through Friday. You know what it is? We, like, after images and words, everything was just like tour studio, tour studio. Tour. Right. That's it, true. It's like the element of, I think, the way. Maybe I, 
I interact and, and become involved with the writing process is like very much just being a band. Right. You come to think of it. Well, a lot of those those riffs and things that they're like a result of sitting in your room since you were 13. You know yeah. what I mean? At, sitting there for hours and I, hours. I think we should maybe get back to sitting just, in our rooms. No, <laughs> no. Get back to like maybe be in a band for like a couple of weeks before we actually go into a record. It's just, I mean, I mean, come on, man. It's great sitting in front of your amplifier and like feeling what you're playing. It is great. The, like, the only difference now is that we're in the studio and then we just record it. <laughs> yeah, but it's just, uh, it's different. It's like really kind of like everybody has their headphones on and yep. only one guy could talk at one time and like you can't play without being heard in everyone else's headphones. It's very, I mean, not that it's a bad thing, but I think it's I different. Think it's way different. It, it, it's a lot like the way things were back then, the way they are now. Yeah, it's but, different. But I don't know. We were kids. Yeah, it's our lives are very, very different now. This audio commentary is turning into a therapy session. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> <laughs> this has been therapeutic for John Myung here. That's right. Let's go back to your childhood. He's changing his hair. He's, <laughs> he's staying in his room for <laughs> six hours. He's hearing when Dreaming Day Night me- music is just bringing him back. E19. Yeah. <laughs> I love. I oh, by the way, not to, not to get back to the actual show. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> yeah, you know, don't talk about that. But I, 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 that's one of my favorite grooves to solo over. That, that sort of G vamp that we were doing. You want to do that on this album? I would love to. Okay. It's very kind of rock and roll, but it had some cool chords in it. You know. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Love, love playing over that. By the way, that last keyboard solo was way extended. Mm-hmm. That's uh, not the same arrangement that's on the album. There's a mystery chord in that chorus that we I think we changed when we rehearsed. Oh with. <laughs> yeah, definitely. There's a couple of mysteries. Yeah. Some things were a little hard to decipher. Off well, the one album. of the things that that we did a lot to, then um, is that we voiced the chords. Like even if we had a more of a standard uh, pro, uh, chord movement, yeah. the bass. Getting back again to the bass, <laughs> would always, wasn't always playing the roots. Uh-huh. We'd put the tensions. In the root, in the bass. In the bass. Uh-huh. So we put nines, oh, and third, yeah, and right. and stuff in the bass. Right. So the chord would sound totally wacky. That's what I'm saying. I think once Prater right. kind of changed that approach, <laughs> yeah, when John was doing his bass tracks and images, I think that's kind of the, you kind of assumed a new role from that point on. I think for future albums and writing. In a way, yeah. By the way, this is a wacky what is part. part? This part was in the original. John, well, John's no. part was on the original. You yeah. And then I added the harmony. But, but yeah. we all, but we all kind of thought that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all agreed that uh, yeah. that it was a stronger, it added a stronger yeah. foundation to the band. Yeah, absolutely. I, I still think it does. Yeah. I think I, it's nice that we have you playing that anchor, you know? For some reason, this, listening to this, I don't know if it's just the production of the mix or whatever, it's, or just even the style, it's really Rush influence. I mean, we were obviously very influenced by Rush in the early days, but just the whole way this is coming across really reminds me of, uh, of Rush. That was our biggest comparison when this album yeah. came out. And when this album came out, uh, eight out of ten reviews yeah. mentioned Rush. Yep. And I think Charlie's voice had a little bit to do yeah, with that it as did, well. Sure. It did, totally. And when we finally got a Canadian in the band, all, all the Rush comparisons went away. Yeah. <laughs> I think because b- by images and words, we were starting to have a little bit more of an identity and a sound and yeah, a style. that's true. I think uh, we're talking about well-written songs. I think this is another one of them where the arrangement is very concise. It's concise and it's w- it's well thought out. Well, this was purposely written to be like a single, as right. Status Seeker was. But as I was mentioning earlier, this is actually the oldest song from When Dreaming Day and I. This was one of the very first things we wrote after Berkeley and after the '86 Majesty demos. I remember walking home from someplace down Boxwood Drive in Kings Park and hearing that chor- the movement of the chorus in my head and then going home and coming up with that chorus. Now, this song was actually Chris performed live with Chris Collins singing with completely different lyrics. 
Chris Collins actually wrote lyrics to this song and came up with the title that. Afterlife. Really? Yeah, there's li- wow. I have live tapes of us playing this song with wow. Chris Al- Collins singing. Same melody and everything? No, completely different, oh, different melody, melody, completely different lyrics. Oh, that sounds kind of familiar. Uh, I, was, I even remember the the verse was, Never high, you'll never see. Oh, my God. <laughs> I do remember it now. So that's where the that's where the name came from. No, no, no. Wait. The uh, oh no no that's where the name came from. And then after he uh, was kicked out of the band, we recorded the instrumental version and kept the name Afterlife on the tape. And then when Charlie joined, he you know saw the name Afterlife and I guess he you know stuck with it and wanted to write lyrics to it. And then he wrote these lyrics. I think Charlie did a, a really good job with these lyrics actually. This was his only solo lyrical contribution because you guys collaborated on Status Secret. Right. You know, we still ask these questions today. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very funny uh, interview with Charlie on the documentary that you'll see where he's talking about writing these lyrics and he's like getting very serious and he's like, uh, you know, people say that lyrics shouldn't answer questions. <laughs> But I say, screw them, you know. And, and Kev was like, what a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie's trying to be like all like... Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's really funny. But one of the things that totally shines through in that documentary is Kevin's sense of humor. Yeah. A, f- a funny... Uh, just a funny fact is that Charlie... When Charlie joined the band, he was older than we, we are in this video. <laughs> so we were like 20... And he was like 36 was like 30, or so. 30, I thought he was older. I thought he was like 30, 38, 39, maybe. 38, I thought. Yeah, he was m- much, much older than us. And we thought that that was so old. Oh, my God, he's 36, 37, 38, and now we're now all we're like 38, older than cool. That. Young. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, but can you imagine us now playing? Yeah, I mean, can you imagine being in a band with a bunch of 20-year-olds? You know? It's hard to imagine. These, these chords are really... Very pretty. This was uh, Holdsworth influence. Mm. Another thing at Berkeley, we used to watch Holdsworth, uh, live Holdsworth, Jimmy Johnson and Chad, Chad Wackerman. Chad Wackerman. And oh, yeah. Remember Alan great doing stuff. these like great voicings with his hands stretched for like 12 frets and, yep. and tapping uh, other notes on top with the right hand. That was a total Holdsworth influence. You played this solo too? I, it looks like you're doing almost every yeah, solo. Yeah, pretty much. At, right off the album. Yeah. Yeah, for the most part, I kept the, the form. It made sense. Except for that part. I mean, talking about what John was talking about earlier, with uh, the way we used to rehearse and write and everything like that, I mean, our lives were so much simpler back then, because we didn't, True. not only did we not have families, but we also didn't have any, we didn't have a career. You know, like after Im- the success of Images and Words, suddenly, we had managers and booking agents and record companies that were on our asses to, you know, stay busy and productive, which which was is great. Mm-hmm. But up until this point, we didn't have a career. We were just a band, local band, just getting together mm-hmm. to rehearse and play and write right. music. And you know, one of the cliches that I've heard somebody say in an interview is that you know, you have your entire life to write your first album. But you only have two months to write your second album, you know? Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and that's the right. case with When Jimmy Day Unite. You know, this was our first album, and we had years and years to write this material and rehearse it. And, you know? We didn't even have, we were living at our parents' houses. <laughs> yeah. Well, we not, except for me, but yeah, yeah, all you guys still Yeah, are. We, didn't, we didn't even have apartments or houses or anything. We were so young. I remember being afraid of getting drafted when the, the, Gulf, War the Gulf War broke out. Yeah. <clears throat> Another f- fact, factoid. Is that the day the Gulf War broke out was the very day that James auditioned for the band. That's right. January nineteenth, ninety one. Yep. Now in this this part when we were rehearsing it, <laughs> big t- I kept telling I wanted to uh hold out the note the first note before John whoa. Sorry. Before John came in. And every time we rehearse it he'd come in like too quick, so I said, Alright, you know, and I hold the note, I'm going to look out into the audience. I don't know if I did it on this. And when you see me give the Satriani nod to the audience, 
you can't see what I'm doing right now, but I'm looking out with my mouth kind of open. Then you can start. So that was the cue. But what do you guys remember writing this intro? I remember uh, using yeah. a harmonizer yeah, in the I studio. Yeah. This was uh, this was the basement of the hair salon. Right? Yeah. Uh, we might have been at Jordan at this. Uh, not Jordan. Dare. At one oh right, right. But you, I, you and John always had stuff like this. There was a lot of stuff like in the Berkeley mm -hmm. demos and stuff where you guys would just do harmonic and guitar pieces. Right, right. Because yeah. we didn't have a band up mm -hmm. to then. <laughs> and this was, the song was originally called Death of Spock because mm -hmm. of this whole intro. It was like something right out of Star Trek. Those, so cards, those chords might be right out of Star Trek. Hmm. It reminds me of a Happy the Man thing. I don't know hmm. if you guys know that hmm. group, but... They just put out a new album, actually. I heard, of, I heard David that, Rosenthal's yeah. in the band. Uh -huh. Yeah, giving him a little plug. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's, it's cool, actually. Have you heard it? Yeah, you have it. Yeah, I got to hear it. Yeah, it's good. Cool. Have you heard the old stuff? No, Not I never did actually. Great. They were on a, f a Prague festival that I did with Transatlantic, but I didn't get to see this. It's great stuff. You got to hear it. And this this is, is our first usage of the five pattern. Yeah. Another part sparked from uh, bass harmonics. That's oh, a nice trippy. Spin there. Yeah, that's cool. that was a good one. That gave me uh, vertigo. Yeah. <laughs> those lights. I I love Ben, but those are the most inappropriate. That's the most inappropriate lighting I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like completely fast moving. It should have been really, really super slow, you know, and yeah. trippy. Another uh, another writing memory. There's a line that says uh, something about the roadway lamplights. And I remember driving, probably driving home from rehearsal, even from Long Beach, where you used to live, and being really tired, and it was raining. And you know when you're driving down the road, and if you look at the, um, the street lights as you go by, it looks like they're connected to the hood of the car as you drive. You ever notice that? I remember getting hypnotized by it. There it is. These vocal melodies were really hard to construct. Oh, yeah. They went through a lot of uh, changes before this version. If you listen, they were to really them. hard to perform too. Yeah, yeah. they're yeah. very, very they're awkward. High, huh? they have to, the time signatures are very, very awkward to sing. Wait, I remember they were written in Charlie's apartment. Mm. Maybe a final version, but yeah. they were original versions. We were working. When we were auditioning singers before Charlie, this was one of the songs we were working on, and we actually worked with a female vocalist. I don't know if you guys remember this. Barbara Chiavelli. Oh, yeah, I remember. And yeah. we actually worked on this song with her. Imagine Dream Theater with a female vocalist. Wow. We would have been it Evanescent. Been, it would have been, been right. now, yeah. Could have been cool. But we were working on this song with her, and she actually sang melodies and yeah, stuff. And I remember her. I have, a, I have a tape of it somewhere in the archives. So that wasn't the first time we worked with a female singer, right? Yeah, at Tracy. Berkeley. Wow. At yeah. Ber when we first put the band together at Berkeley, it was mm -hmm. just the three of us, and there were there was Kevin at home, but we actually auditioned a couple of keyboard players and a couple singers, right. just in case, just in case we could find somebody there and put the band the lineup together there. But obviously, none of them worked out. So. <clears throat> Think of how different it would have been if we actually took one of those Berkeley people and they were still with us. And yeah. Like Kev and Collins and Charlie never entered the picture. It would have been very different. So the bass, way up there playing melodies. Yeah. That's some powerful background singing right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's that cheesy falsetto. Yeah. You know what? It was actually hard for me to play this stuff. Play it net, like when yeah. we had to redo it. I don't know. It was it's like it's, it's it's hard in its own way. Yeah. Just I don't know, a lot of it was just headspace. I think, yeah. Too. <laughs> More fives. A big whole tone uh, appearance there. MB. MB. What? Is it MB? Oh, this yeah. is the ultimate high, high note. Your high note is B. <laughs> 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 You're hearing a B in there somewhere. 
you even said on the on the documentary, John, in, in, in the footage from '89, you said if any song is in E, this song is in E. Because <laughs> the whole that. song is just da 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 da. I mean, just for for eight seven minutes or whatever. Yeah. This solo, uh, oh no, not this part, but the part that follows reminds me of uh, Richie Blackmore and right. Rainbow, I, Gate to Babylon. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the, the thing that I always regretted from the original recording was, I always thought there was way too much delay on this solo. Well, whose call that was? That was a Terry Day thing. Just when it went into the uh, melody, it was just flooded. I think the, the overall sound of One Dream of Day Night is just... Really bad. Yeah, I think that's unlistenable. Like we're tapping, Jordan. Like why? There you go. Why? Why did we stay like, with I, it? Like I don't understand. Like like Terry's done other, other things that have sounded. Great. Terry's done great stuff. But I mean, like, for some reason, it White Zombie, work. Pantera, Soundgarden. That's I mean, what I mean. It, it's very powerful. But with us, it was like complete opposite. A small yeah. budget, limited time. Uh, he had never worked with a keyboard player. All his bands were more metal oriented. Plus, we sucked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that had nothing to do with it. No. <laughs> Maybe, I think it was the gear. The gear. We had no gear. <laughs> we literally had no gear. I remember like... Wait, you were, <laughs> wait, you went in with the Randall. I did, didn't yeah. I? I had a Randall right. solid state. Your BC Rich guitar. Yeah. That's actually uh, when we wait, were doing this album was when wait, you were but, introduced to Ivan. Uh, that's but, right. But you know what? A lot of people use Randall that make great records, so I should say. Yeah. Well, speaking of... Uh, what? Pantera, isn't right. it? Dimebag's, uh, or I shouldn't say Dimebag. Yes, I should. I, I think what was his original name? I, th I think the studio. Diamond. Diamond. That's Diamond Daryl. Yeah. I don't think something was set right at the studio. <laughs> it was just a small budget. I mean, we had three weeks to record and, and mix an entire album. I mean, that's, that's like, you know, it's like doing a demo. Yeah. That's including the mix? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. That's crazy. And I think we wrote very immaturely, to be honest. I mean, some of these songs are cool and they have cool parts, but I mean, I don't think we knew about proper orchestration no. and instruments being in the re proper registers to complement each other. No. I mean, basically, we had guitar, keyboards, and bass all playing in the same register the entire yeah. time. That was a big thing going into Images and Words was, you know, trying to make sense of, of that type of writing and get everybody to be in there. Um, correct spaces this is very Marillion influenced uh, with the keyboard dominating parts but I remember when we wrote this we were going through a big Marillion phase they had just done Misplaced Childhood and Clutching at Straws mm. like a lot of these keyboard sounds remind mm. me of like Mark Kelly yeah and this the lyrics were very fishy yeah <laughs> you know Kev Kev was very into fish as a lyricist as we all were yeah this is a cool uh, unison, one of our many unison parts. This is a cool one. But notice Jordan is playing both parts at the same time. He was doing the unison with his right hand and the chords with, with the right, left. True. Which, of course, Kev never did. The miracle of uh, split keyboard. That's it. No, it's the miracle of Jordan Rudis. Hmm. Split mind. There was one show that we played on tour where we played this song and I completely could not remember one of the parts it comes up <laughs> later <laughs> and I, totally blank and I just I play I just lead bass I'm sorry yeah you're right <laughs> more, just more immature playing yeah. <laughs> I remember like playing the song and like having no idea what the part was and trying to Something. Like I guess I blanked out and I couldn't find the right notes and every note I hit was wrong. <laughs> it went on for like eight measures of wrong notes. Right, and all time <laughs> stops when you're doing that. You're like, yeah. Ah. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a Fiji water uh, endorsement right there. Right. Yeah. Totally. I have a Fiji water right in front of me. I probably had to argue with Ray Amico uh, that day just to get that there. <laughs> <laughs> More lead bass. Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Rothery uh, guitar part. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe Prater should have produced this record. <laughs> <laughs> this way we could have been miserable for two albums instead of just one. <laughs> <laughs> he could have ruined two albums, two recording experiences instead of just one. That's a lot of words there. 
Yeah, that's a very wordy. Huh? That's what I noticed throughout this whole album, singing yeah. it. Is that it was a you know everything was congested lyrically, yeah. you especially Kev's so. back then. Huh? Yeah, especially Kev's though. Yeah, oh, yeah. definitely. Got a lot to say. Yeah, <laughs> a lot to get off his chest. You want to say it all in one <laughs> sentence? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You got to spread it out. I mean, it's different songs. It's the total Marillion part, right? With the uh, the bass staying on the C and the chords moving like that. This was the part. This was the bad memory part coming up. Uh-oh, right? yeah. Uh-oh. close your ears, everybody. The is this the night? No, 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 this isn't the night, though. No, this isn't the night. Oh, no. oh okay. Good. Yeah, That's a good There's thing. another wordy section, too. Look at the lyrics totally. in this. Yeah. A lot of freaking words. These are great lyrics. I, I, I would probably say that these are my favorite lyrics by Kevin Moore. We only knew what they were. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to listen to them. <laughs> Okay. Somebody, re- somebody, yeah. somebody recite the lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, we, we could easily turn that into a rap yeah. song. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool in the background with the clocks going. Listen to the bass. <laughs> I get to keep pointing it out, but it's really like jumping out. It's really incredibly noticeable. This, this What's going on in the background. Oh, some these. Might have something to do with my new improved signature model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> plug, plug. Part's so happy. Mm. We don't write a lot of happy parts. Very major. Anymore. Every chord is major, right? Yeah. I think it's probably mostly Kev's doing. I would think. Yeah. Those chords. Major chords are not part of our game anymore no, at all, right? Definitely not. <laughs> They're not allowed in the studio. You get a ticket if you put a major yeah. chord <laughs> from the Dream Theater Police. Flag on the play. The Dream Police. The Dream mm. Police. That looks very S and M the way you're holding your mic there, man. Hmm. Mm. <clears throat> that must be like that every every night then. I never noticed it. Ooh, that was a badly bent note. That do not disturb sign is really placed in a bad place. It falls on hell me. Look at that. The piece of white oh, yeah, hanging yeah, from my dress. It's yeah. really in a bad spot. That was a nifty key change right there. Yeah. I like that. I remember John Arch singing this song oh. when he was auditioning for us uh, in between Charlie and James. That's cool. Little finger exercise going yeah. on here. That's a good one. Whoa. Good thing I practiced my arpeggios. <laughs> <as a> kid, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> that was some serious arpeggios. This is a, a total uh, thing right out of the Yes book of rules. Rising bass line. Yeah. Right, right. Same chords, but the bass notes are changing. Yeah, it's funny. All of our favorite bands that aren't making these records Yes, and Queensryche, and uh, Marillion. Marillion and Maiden. And now, like, you know, we've toured with these bands. We yeah. know them. Yep. You know, we've toured with Yes, we've toured with Queensryche. Uh, Maiden. We've played with Maiden. We've played with yeah. Marillion. Right. I have, you know, done a side project with Pete. And, you know, it's just like mm-hmm. our lives and careers have become very intertwined with bands that were. Heroes of ours. It's very cool. We were kids. Happens. All except for one. Very cool. Except for Rush. Yeah. They are still the right. exception. Mm-hmm. They still have eluded us after all these years. That's right. I'm I'm chucking chugging down on the E string and then turning up my volume with my other hand. I'm not fixing myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> This is all kind of improvised. And uh, how do we know when to end? Because oh. I do chord note triplets on the magic cowbell. I usually just watch very carefully. <laughs> we have our uh, electronic pad on, on my kit that, with the cowbell sound that actually signals. It's the countdown that tells us. It's all of our signals. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the cue master for us and for our lighting director, Ben. We. But even before the uh, cow- invisible cowbell, I would just do chord note triplets on the china. Right. Right. One, two, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Stop. Thank you all and good night. That's it. When Dreaming Day Unite, boys and girls. That went by quickly. It It did. It's a lot of notes. But you know what? The best is yet to come, and little did that audience know what was in store for them (coughs) right here. I remember that day uh, Charlie came up to me and 
this, you know, came over. This guy, this little guy, all excited and saying hello to me. I had no idea who he was. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, I literally thought he was like a taxi driver. Or something. Oh my god! <laughs> I didn't know who he was. Jeez. And he was like having a whole conversation. We had a with whole you, com- right? we had a whole conversation. He walked away, and then we were hanging out. And then a little later, I said, "Who is that guy?" I think maybe you told me it's Charlie. It then, oh, <laughs> it would have been really funny if you didn't know who he was. Driver, you know, and then you saw him on stage. Right, all of a sudden he comes on stage. I had a whole conversation with him. I thought he was like some a fan driver or something or something. I don't know. <laughs> all of a sudden you see him. I mean, you know, I just saw him. I just because <laughs> I was just, you know, who the hell? Security. <laughs> The only time I've seen him is like, you know, on the record cover. Well, most people actually, you know, uh, until this appearance, he's been in seclusion for 15 right. years. I mean, on the, the on the pictures in the record, he's got like, you know, foot long high heels or something. And so a, lot of, a, a lot, lot of hair lot and of stuff. Hair. Well, actually having Charlie and Jordan together is like the most unlikely pairing. You know, it's like two <laughs> extremes of our right. lives, you know, right, and careers. Right. And here he comes. Joining together, and here he was. There he was. We were, there we were talking Welcome to each other, not to knowing Las Vegas. <laughs> nah, I, th- I, I no. thought it was so cool for Charlie to come out. It was, it was, he was a good guy. And there he is. Now, taxi driver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Charlie sounded incredibly good, considering that he hasn't been singing actively for 15 years. That's true. I mean, it's not like he, like Derek, where after he left the band, he's been working. Well, Kevin even, you know, still works, but Charlie, you know, has, hasn't really done anything in 15 years. No. Come on, he's been practicing these songs at home every <laughs> yeah. day, waiting for this moment. Wait, what's Charlie doing right now? You know, Mike? He's living in San Diego, and I think he's working at, like, a car dealership or something like that. Oh, man. But he, he has told me that after this appearance with us in L.A., it, he was kind of bitten by the bug again and now, like, wants to... Didn't uh, Frank Salmon say? Didn't or our something? manager say you got a call from uh, Charlie really? like a week after? Mm. I know Jim Patolsky did. Yeah, oh, oh, like him so wanting to do yeah, something. Right. right. Get the, the music bug. I mean, uh, I I think Charlie was very talented. I think he was just in the wrong band. You know, it, I've I've often said this, but I'll say it again. It, it was like trying to have Billy Joel singing with Queens, right? Yeah. Definitely. You know, he had a great pop voice, but. You know, we were looking for, uh, you know, a Jeff Tate or a Bruce Dickinson or a James Labrie, you know? Mm-hmm. Just, right. just not what we were looking for at that time. He did entertain us a lot, though. He's very talented. And yeah. and also, it was the only time that we've ever had a singer in the band, with all due respect, James, but as somebody that actually played guitar and played keyboards mm-hmm. and wrote, you know? Right. He, he would actually, at these live shows, play acoustic guitar on yeah. some songs and play piano on some songs. Mm-hmm. So yeah. it was nice to have a, a fifth... <laughs> You know, musician, right? You know, that could play with us, but it just, it just wasn't right for this style of music, really. It was good, yeah. And for those of you that are wondering why Charlie is singing this song, this song was written while Charlie was in the band. Uh, so actually, when putting the set list together, uh, I put "To Live Forever in Metropolis" for the encore because these were the only two remaining. Charlie Error songs, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I, did, I toyed toyed with should Charlie come out on when the Wind Dream and Day Unite set, but I think it was cooler to have the entire Wind Dream and Day Unite with this lineup yeah, and save Charlie mm-hmm. for the encore. Absolutely, yeah. And yeah, this song was very U2 influenced. Yeah, as you'll see on the yeah, documentary, yeah. we wrote this right after we saw the movie Rattle and Hum, yeah, we and, and we immediately wrote this song. This was the first song written. After we recorded One Dream of the Night. And it was performed live with Charlie many times, and there's a live version of this on the documentary. Did Steve Stone ever sing this song? Yeah, yep. That'll probably be coming soon to a Yitze Jam release near you. <laughs> oh my god. But uh, actually, I remember in rehearsals, originally Charlie was gonna sing. The, fi- the, new- the last verse of To Live Forever, which was written right. in 94, yep. when we did it for a B-side for Lie, uh, Lie, and Kev wrote a final verse, and you sang it, James, but Charlie had never sung that, so we went back to just doing the, the, the vamp on that final verse, as, you know, that's the way he knew it when he was in the band. So as if having Charlie on stage wasn't enough, here comes the big grand finale right here. 
which is, I, I think this coming up here is one of the coolest moments in DT history. Right now they're wheeling out Derek's rig. John, how did it feel to have a keyboard player on stage left with you? You know, it it was uh, invigorating. <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna say crowded. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you remember, but in the old days, you and Kevin were together on stage right, and John Myung had stage left to himself. That's because he's playing so many leads and stuff. <laughs> yeah. He needed the room. He needed the space yeah. to work it all out. Yeah. Plus, he was a wild man back then. Yeah. You didn't want to get near him. That old majesty footage, John is thrashing around, headbanging. Yeah, you might get hit if you were near him on stage, right? There he is. There he is. For those of you wondering, Kevin Moore was indeed uh, invited to this reunion. And, uh, unfortunately, passed on the invite. So here are seven out of... I thought that was so bizarre, the way Derek has been playing the keys. And I remember I asked yeah. him about that, and he said he finds it actually easier than the uh, traditional hmm. method. Interesting. It's all show. It's all about it show It is business. show, for it's sure. Show business, baby. So actually, this was uh, also sung by Charlie back in uh, 89. This was written in 89 and performed live with Charlie several times. Yeah, you guys split up that intro, right? Yeah. Metropolis. Hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, that's friendly. You see that? I was like all smiles that night. At this point, it was just like, this was cool. Just sitting back and enjoying the best seat in the house. I love that you guys harmonize this line in here. And you do a harmony later, that is really awesome too. You remember breaking up these lyrics? Mm hmm totally. Charlie was so easy to work with, you know. He's such a, uh, that would have been about the fourth time I think I met him that night. Mm. But uh, each and every time I met Charlie, he was a very gracious human being. And uh, just really easy to sit down and speak with the guy. He's a cool guy. I wonder if there was anybody in the audience wondering who, who he was. Because he was, no, right, sure he was introduced. But if you don't know yeah, the history know. of the band. Yeah, I'm sure there are a lot of people. Well, you know what I mean? Know. Yeah, but they people just sat through it at 45 minutes of When Dream of Day Unite. Right. I mean, if they didn't know that album, yeah, that's then true. they wouldn't know Charlie. Right. But so a lot of people were very confused. They must have been. They never night. heard those songs before. Then there's some guy singing. And, and then there's this guy, Derek. <laughs> who the hell is he? Like, right. <laughs> I mean, there are some Maybe people. Maybe some people don't know who he is. No, I, I, oh, I think they no offense. You'd have to be really clueless if you didn't know who Derek was. I mean, he, he's been right. on many of our DVDs, and you know, we did a lot of touring yeah. with him. But Charlie was never. We never toured with Charlie, and it's a very obscure album in our catalog. Mm -hmm. It's a nice duet, there. Mm -hmm. We're all we're all mesmerized. We're yeah, right. <laughs> we're actually watching this <laughs> and enjoying it. It's bringing us back. That's right. I see, there's a guy in the front there is totally enjoying the moment. Yeah, He's yeah, appreciating yeah. the effort that went into this uh, this whole event. Yeah. Look at Charlie dancing all. Oh yeah, stage. yeah, that dance, <laughs> right? I could play this stuff in my sleep. How many times have we played Metropolis? Ugh. Now, this isn't the first time that Jordan and Derek have been on stage together. Because we, uh... It was in 98, right? Yeah, we toured together. Oh, yeah, right. You were, yeah. you were our, our opening act throughout a lot of 98. And uh, there were a couple of nights where you would actually jump on stage and do uh, some LTE, LTE stuff with me and John. Yeah. 
It was fun. And obviously you and Derek spent a lot of time together, you know, mm-hmm. through, with, with, through all that touring. Yeah, I remember going up on stage and talking shop with him many times on that tour. We are really speechless. We're all we just are. enjoying the show. Yeah. Hey. What was that? A fan. That was a fan? Yeah. That yelled there? Yeah. It was loud. There he is. Another big bass moment. Uh, whoever mixed that put way too much wet on your cabinet right there. Sounded like a, a Lemmy. Lemmy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually no. prefer it that way because it's actually easier to play. Well, check <laughs> it out. Here are the, tra- the, uh, the yeah, big trades that we did. It was a lot of fun. This was great. Derek looks like Steve Stevens. Yeah, he does. So the hair. Who he now plays with. Yeah. He plays with Steve Stevens? Yeah, he's uh, with Billy. Yeah, he's been playing Billy with Billy Idol, Idol for years. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And Steve Stevens played on his latest album, too. I like Steve Stevens. Yeah, he sounds great, actually. Yeah. You took the Eddie Van Halen approach for your first trade-off. I did. Off. Half a teacher. Interesting. Hmm. Decided not to shred. You didn't have to prove anything. That's also very Steve Morse. And that's... What's that song? <laughs> Green-Eyed Lake? <laughs> Am I thinking of Frankenstein? Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. A little like, southern thing. Yeah. Or bluegrass. really tickling the ivories. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's my approach to this solo. It's a gentle kind of tickle. <laughs> tickle me, Jordan. <laughs> it's interesting that I think your lead sound is similar to yeah. Derek's. At least... With the wah wah. Yeah, it's got a lot of wah yeah. and feedbacky stuff. What, right. what would you say are the, the similarities or the differences between your two styles? Um, similarities or differences? Well, there's so many because I'm coming from a very cl- classical background in general. I mean, if you're talking about just the lead approach? Yeah. To narrow it down? Well, I generally use one hand a whole lot more than he does. <laughs> he tends to use, although I was using two there, but. And also, Derek used to to do his expression. He uses a joystick on the, uh, you know, with his left hand to do all the pitch bending, mm-hmm. and I'm using a, a pitch wheel for everything that I do. I'm going back to the uh, like the Jan Hammer, Patrick Moraz kind of uh, approach. But actually, both Derek and I have some background in guitar. So as far as bending goes, we're both kind of very conscious of that, uh, you know, the rock and element that it takes to make it happen. Yeah, I think we, I think we messed up the trades here. I think we better talk over this section, Johnny, yeah. because uh, this part we got a little. Confused. But the problem is, is we're trading in with three members, right? right. So it, to, it makes it very confusing. Out. Yeah, but it was fun anyway. Yeah, we all start going nuts. Nobody noticed. And back into the uh, album. This is very uh, dregs. Yeah, influence this part. Oh, that was the lead part. It's total Morse. Especially right there. Yeah. It's Morse and T-Lab. It's yeah. Swing. Two, three, four, five. It's also, by this point, <laughs> it's very booking. Oh, yeah. The tempo is cranking. Maybe if you, if you would A-B the album version. The idea we were here was to jam this part, but it never happened. Mm. Look, you're getting into war mode, uh, war stance right there, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you got dueling, uh, dueling keyboards. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I mean, it's a shame that Kevin didn't join us, but can you even picture him up there right now? Mm. I can't. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like he's so far removed from this type of music right mm-hmm. i don't think I, I think i think that's probably big, why he didn't want to do part it. why he didn't even uh, accept it yeah i wonder if, i wonder if he invite. could even play music like this anymore i mean he's 
so far removed from it. Can you picture him up there shredding away no, like this? I can't picture it. It'd be a shame if he let it all, all his finger uh, technical stuff go, you know. He has. I mean, if you listen to anything he's done since leaving the band, te- you know, 10 years ago, uh-huh. I don't think I've heard a single lead from him in 10 mm. years. It kicks into Kev Solo and his, like, samples. Right. <laughs> yeah. A loop. Vocal samples. <laughs> And like techno loop and he's moving like a filter knob <laughs> this is another one of those parts that just is embedded in the DNA yeah. of all of us it sounds confusing but I wonder how much Derek had to prepare to do this he obviously hasn't played this song in ages yeah. It's pretty complicated. Yeah, yeah but he's but, yeah. he's he's got his chops yeah, he, probably he's more been constant, you know, consistent. Right. His with chops all this are probably stuff. better or at least more sharper now than they were when he was in the band. That's true. You know, I mean the stuff he does with Planet X and everything is, is completely it's crazy over the top. Yeah. You guys kiss? <laughs> oh, almost. <laughs> almost. We didn't have enough time. Yeah. When he was with us, he just was Nicky Lemon's dude. He just wanted to rock. Yeah. You know, I think he got way more progressive after, you know, we we, That's true. we uh, replaced him. Right now he's thinking, they love me. They love me. No, <laughs> he, he would do it, he's doing it in his voice. <laughs> they love me. <laughs> Show business is my life. <laughs> I think this was really cool, having seven of us up there. I mean, that's like, who would have ever thought? Really, really cool. It worked. It totally worked. What's we, next? We're going to have to do a whole tour <laughs> like this, like yeah. when Yes did it. Right, right. Well, this was the 15th anniversary when Dream and Day Unite, but next year, on our next world tour, it'll be the 20th anniversary of the band. Wow. Yep. So we'll have to play it's true. every album from <laughs> start to finish. <laughs> Let me take that back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You gotta watch what you say, what Jordan. What am I saying? I'm insane. <laughs> Thing is, is that Images 15th isn't just too far off yeah. in the distant. Mm. You know, I think uh, every album is obviously. I mean, any year you could look and say, okay, well, this is the 10th year of, of, of Awake or the 15th of Images. But, you know, there's something special about this because it was our first album and a lot of these songs had never been played and people wanted to hear the first album we've done with you singing james and so you know i don't think this will be a tradition where we celebrate anniversaries of albums it was just really special for this particular album you know i I don't know if this would be something that we would you know get into doing on a regular basis i think derek derek got the uh privilege of the end chord (laughs) yeah ripping yeah, look, you guys yeah. aren't even doing it. No. You got to be gracious. <laughs> Somebody's in your house. <laughs> <laughs> Good audience. We ran out of Fiji. I think I have an Aquafina there. <laughs> you have to call Ray Amico about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Well, that about Very wraps it up. That was a pretty fun concert. It was fun. Did Very you mention nice. that was the first time many of us have seen that? Uh, what video? This is probably this the first video? time any of you guys have you seen it, right. right? That's right. Oh, all of us, yeah. And it was the first time I've seen it. It's fun. And Wait. every time we do this, I learn a lot about this band. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much it's left, great, though, Jordan. I think we've actually covered most of the ground now. You, right. You now I've played pretty, most of the songs, or almost, I guess... You actually have. You've played almost the entire Dream Theater catalog. Yeah. By knocking out this album in wow. one shot, you really are up to date. And yeah. much to the jealousy of a lot of guys who play keyboards out there, I actually have charts for all these songs. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you know the history of the song. Now I know the history. That's right. Yeah, where they came from. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, uh, you've been in the band now maybe longer than, I think, longer than Derek was in the band, and surely more yeah. albums, more tours. Yeah, so and at this point, you're I've no played like the guy. Iron Maiden, the Metallica, so I've learned like the, the core and the That's thinking true. behind a lot of the writing. And that is true. I'd say i got a fairly good feel for what's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, All it's right. been a... It's been a. It was a historic show. It's great. Any parting remarks, real quick, yeah. before it ends? It was a great night. It was a lot of fun, and a 
really, really cool theater and yeah. a very special night. It was a high vibe indeed. Absolutely. Enjoy it. All the boys. And everybody was really, really cool at night. Thanks to Derek and Charlie. Yeah. They were great. They were very cool. Fantastic evening. And here comes the final yeah. bow. Uh, we're going to go to the barber now? Yeah, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> Want to talk about the old days a little bit before the thing ends, Johnny? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, well, hey, Doug, <laughs> Doug, you want to say hi and bye quick? Hi. Let's go Oberkirker back there. Mm-hmm. I like Slipknot up there. <laughs> 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 All right. That's the end. Over and out. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you yeah. on tour. Bye. Bye.